Welcome to everyone who has joined this webinar so far. I think we've got a few more joining us in the next moment or two. Um, I will start off slowly, but with respect to those who have arrived to the event on time, we are now starting. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm Sharon Constanson. I'm chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce based in the UK, a country that at the moment is showing temperatures of way below freezing. The snow fell a few days ago, probably about four or five days ago now, and it's still frozen on, uh, outside. So it still looks beautifully wintry and very, very pretty and very different parts of the Western Cape, I understand, which are sitting at 40 degrees today and tomorrow. So a very different environment in our two countries in that respect. Um, we've had very good interest in this event, which is fantastic. So it shows that the initiative for trade and the initiative to do business, the entrepreneurial nature of what people want to do and the requirement for product in the other centers is definitely a uh, important aspect of the future economic growth for countries and regions like the Western Cape, but equally for those that they are supplying to and importing from. One of the things I'd just like to mention quickly before we get into the event itself is tomorrow night the South African Chamber is running in combination with the um, Lord Mayor of the City of London and the High Recorder of the Old Bailey, a film called Life is Wonderful. This has been done by a previous UK High Court judge and it's about the Ravonia trial. Definitely a, a film worth watching particularly if you've got South African roots, but otherwise just the amazing spirit of the people in those difficult times back in the 1960s. So just wanted to highlight that to you because it is tomorrow and um, hopefully you, many of you can join us, uh, which is going to be a very good event. Health and safety, uh, those of you in the UK that are probably at home, I think you know where the front door is. If you're in your offices, I can't help you. Hopefully you know your way out if you have to get there in a hurry. We don't plan any fire alarms where I am. Um, there is a Q&A function, if I could ask you all to please use that. Uh, the chat function is not operational. Um, well, I don't think it's operational, you never know, it might still be. But uh, the Q&A function, if you could please use that to post questions, put them up while the people are talking, while you think of the question, and when it gets to question time, I'll be collating what you are putting up there for us, and we'll be asking your specific questions to the panel. At this point, I'd like to introduce the panel very esteemed panel and lucky guys they're all in Stellenbosch uh, at the moment so enjoying the very pleasant weather i'd like to introduce to you uh, premier uh, uh, windy of, of the western cape uh, the um, western cape minister for finance and economic opportunities uh, minister mania uh, the western cape minister for agriculture minister mayor the ceo of westgrow tim harris and the CEO of Wines of South Africa, Siobhan Thompson. This is our panel, very esteemed panel, very experienced in the topics that we're gonna be talking about, which is trade. And very specifically, we're focusing on the Western Cape into South Africa, globally, Africa. So we'll be talking around all those various topics. But to start, we're going to uh, zone, hone in and zoom in on Alan Windy who is the uh, Premier of the Western Cape. Uh, Alan, I ask your cameraman to zoom in on you. And if you could just please set the scene for us and give us the positioning of where the Western Cape is at this point in time. And we will pick up with conversations thereafter. Thank you, Alan. Well, uh, very good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, great to see from our side, uh, Dean as well. And Tim and Siobhan on the on the screen, but of course uh, here next to me, Minister Mayer and uh, Minister Mania, and uh, we find ourselves, as you said, here in Stellenbosch, uh, in amongst the vineyards. So if you look out the window here, or if you could look out the window, you'd see the vineyards right next to us. Um, but we're at the Techno Park in uh, in Stellenbosch, and the reason that we're all here is that we actually had a Bosporat this morning as government. Uh, in these times when you have to be nimble, you have to be able to uh, deal with the pressures that are facing you as a government. And uh, we were talking about that, about restructuring, reorganizing and being a nimble uh, and effective government. And uh, I think specifically globally today, that is really what is needed right now. And uh, of course, uh, I think what I'm going to talk about uh, as well is our 
our uh, response to COVID-19 and uh, sort of, I think that also shows what kind of government we are when, uh, when I can uh, tell you about some of the things that we did uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic first and second wave. But of course, uh, COVID-19 has not left us yet and has got an impact not only on us, but I think also on our Western Cape uh, UK relationship because it affects uh, specific uh, components of the tourism trade and investment side of what we want to be talking about today. But uh, I also want to say on the, on the onset or in the, at the onset is thank you very much for this platform because I think we need to have more and more of these kind of discussions. In the past, uh, it was, you know, how, how many times a year could we make it over to the UK for trade missions or vice versa? And uh, I think with this new modern world we've been forced into, we need to actually create more of these kind of platforms because it does allow us to converse. It does allow us to deal with issues that are perhaps facing us uh, and quickly and decisively. I think also specifically because of the importance of the UK market for us as the Western Cape. Uh, it is a very key and important market. Uh, you are, uh, you know, our top trade investment and tourism uh, uh, um, space in the world. Uh, and you hold, you hold first, second, third or fourth positions when it comes to, uh, you know, how we trade and how we, uh, how we uh, you know, make available investment opportunities for British companies and, of course, tourism. So when it comes to trade, um, I think uh, primarily, uh, if you see what's happened now with, uh, with COVID-19, um, which is affecting a lot of business around the world, I think our huge opportunity is definitely agriculture. Uh, we've seen it now during the last year um, as a sector in our economy that has grown and has, uh, has uh, continued to attract investment. And I think there's definitely many, many opportunities there. If I look at uh, that component of our trade, uh, we saw in 2018 a 7.5% growth in trade and uh, the UK is our second most important or our second biggest trading partner globally. But, uh, but agriculture makes up a big component of that, specifically wine, grapes and citrus. Um, but I think there's also other opportunities that we can talk about and uh, we need to have a look at where they lie, especially right now. I think we've also come through a time where we've had substantial droughts in our region. Um, and of course, we've uh, had some good rains and our dams are full. And that's also going to have a, a definite impact on our ability to grow uh, new markets, uh, to grow new products into the market, specifically from an agricultural point of view. When I look at investment, I think as well, a very key an important market, especially foreign direct investment. If I look at the last 15 years, 1.76 billion US dollars worth of uh, FDI on 97 projects. But again, the business, the business services side of those investments, um, also very key to our region and uh, also nearly a billion dollars worth of, uh, worth of FDI, 24 projects coming into the region. How do we look at uh, enabling more advantage for businesses in the UK to invest here, uh, and not necessarily only here because of the Western Cape and South Africa, but how do you choose the Western Cape as your Africa strategy because of the role that many businesses play uh, in our region here in the southern tip of Africa, the ecosystem that we have, um, and the advantage for UK businesses to use this as a platform to trade up into Africa, not just necessarily here. And I talk about that ecosystem. Um, I said I'm at the Techno Park, and specifically between Cape Town and Stellenbosch itself. I mean, we are the, the tech hub or the tech capital of Africa. This is the Silicon Cape or the, our Silicon Valley is, is this region. Uh, we're number five in the world when it comes to fintech. We do really uh, box way above our fighting weight. And, uh, and I think there's lots of opportunity there as well. And then, of course, tourism. I mean, you're a very key source market, our number one source market when it comes to tourism. And uh, obviously, with Brexit, with air travel, uh, not with Brexit, but with, uh, with COVID-19 and, and air travel, we uh, have some work to do. And I think that's also what we need to use a platform like this. How do we engage? What do we need to do about uh, helping to open up markets? Uh, perhaps there's a, there's a different kind of market. Maybe, maybe we need to move to quicker decision making. Maybe it's a younger traveler. I think uh, there are going to be definitely opportunities coming out of this time, and we've got to find how we 
uh, work together in enabling those opportunities. Um, I mentioned the word Brexit, and maybe I should say something that uh, I'll never forget when the vote was counted, counted on Brexit. And because you are such an important market, uh, within an hour, I was then on to your then uh, Consul General here, Ed Roman. And uh, within a few days, we'd had our first uh, Brexit meeting here in Cape Town. We'd arranged a number of uh, visits to the UK. And I must say that uh, between all of the officials, we really sort of grabbed this as an opportunity as well to how can we continue to grow our relationship uh, within that framework. But I think before I hand over and we get onto the panel, I want to also just say a few things about COVID-19 and where we find ourselves at the moment. Uh, we as a region have uh, just gone through the second wave of the pandemic. Our, uh, in our region of the Western Cape, I think, first of all, I always uh, say that our, when you measure our, our, uh, our, our wave of, of this pandemic, it doesn't look like the normal wave that you see in so many countries and also in other regions of our country. It is not a, a sort of volcano shape where it goes up, it peaks and it comes down again. In our province, in both of these waves, it's climbed quite rapidly. We've flattened it and taken it down the other side. I always say that our shape just uh, mirrors that of our table mountain. And that shows you that uh, the interventions and what we do about flattening the curve shows that we've got really responsive mechanisms on measuring and on dealing with, uh, with COVID-19. And I think we need to say that I think that kind of nimbleness and that effectiveness of a government must surely show people that uh, we have great responses. We've got a very capable government. I always say to our team, and we, I could say it again today, that uh, we had a world-class response. Of course, it's not over yet. Uh, we are now uh, moving into the phase where vaccines are uh, the call of the day. We've got to get uh, our programs going. You might have seen we've got a bit of a setback on our second strain, and we're busy working on that flat out at the moment. Our region is committed to procuring vaccines over and above the national procurement because we also know that uh, in the interests of trade, investment, tourism, the quicker we get our population vaccinated and uh, in a place that we can open up uh, our markets, uh, the better. And uh, we are fully committed to that. But also something that uh, we must never forget during this time is that uh, this last year has been a really exciting time when it comes to innovation in government. And we've learned a lot and we need to now take those learnings and put it into every single thing that we do. We've learned how to build, build hospitals in six weeks. We built the biggest field hospital in the Southern Hemisphere and we did that in six weeks. Uh, all of our field hospitals were Wi-Fi enabled, had world-class cutting uh, uh, technology on waste management. Uh, we uh, had a big issue in our region where uh, people, specifically elderly people, would have to queue from very early in the morning outside of our clinics to get their comorbidity medicines. It was a risk because you put people who were high-risk individuals of uh, contracting COVID-19, and now you want to put them in queues and make them wait for hours. Well, we did a partnership with the uh, private sector and government and uh, NGOs on the ground, and very happy to say that that innovation now, we deliver medicine parcels to those people at risk to their homes. Uh, we've delivered more than 1.2 million medicine parcels to people at risk in our system. And that was an innovation that came out with partnerships and uh, an innovation that now has become the norm. We can't slip back at actually how things happen now in this region. And so many more uh, learnings happened in the last year that are going to definitely enable us as a region. Uh, I spoke about the tech capital. Uh, we're very proud of our open, transparent uh, governance over the last year. And uh, one of those areas of making sure that the citizens understand what happens with regard to this virus and where we are every single day, we've had a dashboard developed that goes down to suburb level. Uh, and we've won three international and national awards now for innovation and technology competing with the private sector. And here a government sector actually wins these awards. So we've uh, learned a lot as well, but I think we've also shown people that uh, we are a responsive government. We're able to deal with crises and whether it was this or a drought, or even just putting on a major event like the World Cup. We've shown that, uh, that uh, we can respond 
uh, as a government and uh, as a region. But uh, thank you very much for this platform. I think it's an excellent platform in which to engage and we need to see more of these and we're happy to be part of more of these. And uh, I will leave much more of the rest of the talking to the ministers on my left and my right who are responsible for the actual reason for this discussion, which is trade, which is investment and uh, which is tourism. Thank you very much. Alan, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it, Premier. It's fantastic to hear your words, the positivity, the uh, reference to being nimble, agile, and being able to respond to the needs of uh, your people and of business and of the economy. So, but you did say something that alerted me to asking a question. Any idea whether the Lions tour is going to happen? I'm going to go straight to Minister Mania. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sharon. I've uh, obviously uh, picked up that uh, hospital pass, I think is the term in, uh, in rugby. The truth of the matter is, I mean, uh, as, as far as, as we are aware, uh, the British Irish Lions tour is on. Uh, the Western Cape government uh, and the city of Cape Town uh, remain absolutely committed uh, to doing everything we can to ensure that the uh, tour goes ahead. And our last meeting, and Tim might want to uh, build on my reply uh, because he joined me in the meeting, our last meeting with uh, Yuri Ru of uh, Saru took place uh, last week. Uh, and uh, Saru are in a process of uh, consultation uh, with their, 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 their partners, uh, as well as a national government on a certain elements that relate to the tour, uh, particularly uh, regulations around uh, uh, stadiums uh, and obviously the forecast of the environment when the when the tour takes place. Uh, as I understand it, uh, they uh, will uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks uh, then have to make some final decisions. But I mean, I have to also be frank. Uh, the tour. Uh, is uh, set to go ahead. We are committed to enabling that, uh, but uh, there are constraints uh, that we do, that we have to uh, face in uh, the environment. But certainly, I think in the next uh, couple of weeks, we should have uh, finality uh, about the British uh, Irish Lions tour. I'm not sure if uh, Tim would like to add to that. He uh, joined me in the meeting uh, and, has, and has also done uh, some very good work in this environment. I'm happy to come in uh, there. Thanks, uh, Minister. The, the the story with the Lions tour reminds me a little bit about an anecdote from the 1980 tour when the, the Lions were playing in Bloemfontein and uh, the, the Free State Centre was cutting holes through their defence and the Lions Centre, Ray Gravel, he couldn't take it any longer. You know what playing in the Free State is like? The grass was brown. The soil was hard and he was sick of seeing these orange jerseys fly past him. So he, the, the Lions hard man hit the center hard and very, very late, long after he passed the ball. So the ref ran over and called him angrily and said, that was the latest tackle I've ever seen. And Gravel replied instantly, sorry, ref, I got there as fast as I could. I think that's, that sums up the, the spirit of, of the Lions So for many around the world, it's the pinnacle of rugby. Uh, and I think, as David said, just like uh, that incident, we, the, the Lions tour uh, may be late, but hopefully we'll get there as soon as, as we can. I, I think for us, it's hard to imagine a more important tourism moment. About 40,000 British uh, and Irish Lions supporters are expected to come. Uh, as the MEC said, there, there are kind of three regulatory hurdles that need to be crossed. The uh, ability to, to leave the UK and travel to South Africa, the ability to, to be welcomed into South Africa, and then obviously the potential to fill the stadiums. All three of those things are required by both the Lions side and the SA rugby side. Um, and the briefings we've got uh, set out uh, approximately a month timeline in order to make those decisions, but they depend very much on what the Premier spoke about earlier, which is the, the health outlook 
and particularly the success of vaccination on both sides. Um, for us, this would be the high point of uh, British tourism to South Africa for the year and an excellent way to signal that we're open for tourism uh, and host as many British Irish Lions supporters as possible. So like MEC Mania said, uh, we're preparing for that welcome and we hope that the regulatory pieces fall in place, Sharon. Thanks very much, Tim. Well, I've had my ticket for many, many, many months and I'm definitely not going to go to Australia to watch it. So I hope those rumours are rumours and go nowhere near <laughs> reality. That would be absolutely I'm disastrous. <laughs> Um, just coming back to uh, Premier and the Ministers, could I just ask, um, here in the UK we're getting um, uh, bad press, bad reputation, whatever the word is you want to use. We're having the reference to the South African variant of the COVID virus and whether the vaccines will work, whether you've got the right vaccines, all these things around that sort of negativity, but potentially of obviously risk that these this is still a, um, a problem for health, but it's equally a problem for um, investment, economic development. And also it's a problem from the fact that it is tiring South Africa's reputation. Um, any comment that you'd like to make that can help those listening from a investment or business point of view relative to the South African variant of the um, virus? I'm happy to, to kick off and then maybe David and Tim will also come in or, or Ivan. Um, but first of all, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, how, do we, how do we get people to say not the South African variant? It's called YV2 <laughs> or 501V2 um, because this variant happens to be in other places as well as South Africa. But of course, it is a conundrum for us. And uh, I think you would have seen that on Sunday, um, in actual fact, our AstraZeneca rollout of uh, the vaccines has been uh, put on hold. Um, we are really uh, exponentially growing our research capabilities with the, with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which so far seems to be um, the most uh, effective across the spectrum of uh, variants. Um, and then also there's uh, we also sort of trying to say how do we get the other vaccines to to trial as quickly as possible, and uh, all of this is so we can get the Lions tour going, but um, it is it is uh, really urgent for us. Uh, and I think as I said in the beginning, as a as a region, we have a we have also said publicly that uh, you know we are going to put investment in ourselves. Business is prepared to partner with us into investment. Uh, as well as the national government to make sure that we get vaccines into our system as quickly as possible. In the next, uh, hopefully days, and not weeks, but in the next days, once we have uh, those finalizations of the trials, um, that we've got orders in place to make sure that we get as many of those vaccines into arms as quickly as possible. Um, there are already, um, you know, uh, a number of vaccines on order, but we've got to get those trials completed. So, uh, yeah, that's from my side. We will commit to funding. Uh, we've already we've already committed to the slickest, quickest, uh, most efficient rollout uh, across our province from from a vaccination rollout point of view. We've just got to get the right decision on uh, which of the one, two or three vaccines that we're going to be rolling out. I don't know if you want to add to that, uh, Minister May. Uh, Sharon, I think it's an excellent point that you raise. Uh, we are obviously concerned about it because, uh, you know, the YV2 has been sort of christened uh, as the, the South African variant. And as you correctly point out, uh, that does uh, cause uh, a reputational brand damage. Uh, but we have actually uh, some experience of this. And in fact, uh, Tim Harris and Wes Grow, uh, are uh, running our response. And I wonder if, if Tim uh, would, would come in here. Yeah, absolutely, I'm, I'm happy to. You know, this is one of those stories that we understand well in, in South Africa, uh, Sharon. Uh, it, you, can, you can think about it a little bit like this, the story of uh, Cape Town potentially being the first city to run out of water a few years ago. That was the story doing the rounds globally. But actually, at the heart of that story was an unbelievable transition to water efficiency that was world-class by citizens and business in the Cape. 
And as the Premier says, the, the real headline was Cape Town, the first city in the world to avoid running out of water. Uh, and since then, many of us have spent a lot of time uh, talking about the, the kind of best practice example of, of dealing with climate change. Uh, in the same way, this variant that was identified and discovered in South Africa is actually testament to the fact that we're one of the few countries in the world, and in fact, one of the only developing countries doing extensive mapping of the genome of the virus and tracking the evolution of the mutations. So actually the point is uh, one of about our medical capabilities that are at a world-class level here in South Africa. And it's unfortunate that um, particularly the British press is uh, in fact misrepresenting the, the situation by referring to it as something that is kind of emerged from here and somehow makes us uh, less safe. So we do have a big job on our hands to, to manage that reputational risk, but uh, we're very experienced in dealing uh, with crises. This is one of the first that we've, we're dealing with at the same time as everybody else. Uh, and we've got uh, a suite of tools and techniques that involve getting all of our partners on the same message, that involve using digital platforms to, to influence the narrative uh, around the destination. Uh, you can be sure we're rolling out those elements uh, of the playbook that we developed through the drought uh, to manage the reputational risk that we face from this variant that was discovered first uh, here in South Africa. So uh, hopefully we can turn this from something that right now is a negative in the same way that day zero was into something that will be a positive talking about really sophisticated uh, medical capabilities here in South Africa. I think your final point that you made there, Tim, for me is extremely valid. You have the medical capabilities, the research capabilities, and the ability to have determined that the variant existed. And it's not to say you were the first country to have it, you were the first country to find it. Maybe that can be part of your messaging. Um, and if you're taking on the British press, please do so and successfully, because they really can be quite annoying. Uh, they definitely have a very different view on the way to go about informing the public. So a difficult one there. Um, Tim and um, uh, David, I think it was you as well, made reference to, uh, and Alan, you did in your original speech, is the issue around water and what uh, the Western Cape has done to deal with the water issues. Now, I know when I was at school, we were talking about the water issues in the Western Cape. Can you give us some ideas of what that has done? What has actually been done? How does that impact the tourists? Because they don't have to worry about not flushing the loo. And what has it done for things like agriculture? I am aware that you've had the most amazing rains recently. So it's not an, an, an issue that's going to repeat itself immediately. But how, when the seven year cycles move through, is it going to impact um, the way the Western Cape survives the next drought? I'm not sure who would like to pick that up. Alan, uh, whether you'd like to direct it to one of your ministers. Um, yes, Ivan's going to deal with that. Maybe yes. Ivan would be best, yeah. Excellent, Ivan, yeah. looking forward to hearing uh, from you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Saron and the panel members, and also thank you, Dean McPherson, uh, for arranging this uh, meeting. Uh, what we have done specifically, the one biggest single thing that has happened as a result, as Tim rightly pointed out, we had uh, achieved something that normally takes you generations, namely immediate fundamental behavioral change in terms of water consumption. Uh, we had some very good rains now. Uh, we have about between 80 and 98 percent of the dam levels that we currently have. We had engaged with the National Department of Water Affairs. We've also commissioned through our Department of Local Government uh, hydrologists to do a very comprehensive study about water quality throughout the province. We have developed for every single municipality uh, here in the Western Cape a water resource management plan, because in some cases it's not the shortage of water, it is the management of the water resource and so we have put such uh, mechanisms in place. But I think for, from a tourist perspective, no tourists should worry about water because we have enough water, not only for human consumption, but particularly also for the agricultural sector. We know that about two years ago, one of my colleagues, the Minister of uh, Community Safety, took a few people to the Tiervartes Group Dam and they walked on the surface of the dam. 
I was there about three months ago. The dam was overflowing and we had a prayer meeting, a Thanksgiving meeting, because I think we are now in a very good space uh, in that context. But despite the worst drought in a hundred years, we have seen, for example, between the period of 2008 and 2018, over that 10 year period, the Western Cape was responsible for 50% of all South Africa's agricultural exports. And that was also during parts of the drought. So what I'm referring to is a very resilient agricultural sector. We also now have seen through work that was done by my colleagues department, the Minister of Finance and Economic Development through the Bureau for Economic Research and Development. We have seen also massive growth in our export capabilities, particularly also uh, on the African continent. In fact, all uh, significant export go on the African continent. But from a UK perspective, we have seen, and I've recently met with the South African fruit industry, and they have confirmed that their figures has indicated that about 14% of all South Africa's fruit goes to the, U the United Kingdom, and about 44% goes also to the rest of uh, the Europe. So the UK is for us a very important uh, market, not only because of the traditional and cultural linkages, but because we can service that market from a logistical perspective, also from uh, Rotterdam, as you know, the biggest market. Uh, we normally take part in the fruit logistica uh, in Berlin, uh, the biggest fruit festival. And when I took up the job, the Premier gave me one mandate, namely, to increase market access. So my target over the next five years to increase market access by 5%, and the UK is a significant part of that market in order to create about 19,000 new jobs. So the question is, what does that uh, market uh, access strat strategy entails? Firstly, it entails protecting our traditional markets like the United Kingdom. It, we all have also established a market uh, access facilitation unit we also now busy modernizing our export uh, and maintain the standards, particularly as it relates to the veterinary services. And I'm very happy Tim is here uh, because they are our investment and trade promotion agency. We have established an agricultural investment unit within Tim's uh, component. And we see significant progress that they have made in terms of economic diplomacy and facilitation. So. I think I'm quite excited about the uh, opportunities that they exist here. We also regularly lahai Saron with the Fruit Producers Export Forum. We've got a good working relationship with them. They're also based here uh, in Cape Town. Uh, and we had some excellent production, particularly grain, uh, canola, wine, grape. Uh, and as you know from the couple of years, is a massive increase in production in the blueberries. And if I just look at the figures in terms of agricultural production, Alan is correct, the verticulture, rooibos tea, citrus, the deciduous fruit, in fact, the, the deciduous fruit and other fruit had seen a 61% change in between 2019 and 2020. Uh, while the biggest change that we have seen uh, is the ostrich feathers and products from the Western Cape, almost about 160% increase in that. So yes, I think we are ready. We are to facilitate market access, particularly in the United Kingdom and the relationship that we now have, particularly with your institution. I think people want to know, is there the political stability? The most political stability we'll find on the African continent is under the leadership of our Premier Alan Windy. There's great leadership in agriculture. We have about 7,000 commercial agriculture. And I want to conclude, uh, Sharon, the latest report that I've received from Stats South Africa has indicated that commercial agriculture here in the Western Cape contributed about 63 billion rand in revenue. So we have an agricultural sector that is well in and alive. And Alan has alluded to the growth of the agricultural sector last year in 2020, in the first and in the second quarter, all the other sectors of the economy had negative economic growth. We were very resilient in agriculture, 28% growth in the first quarter and 15% in the second quarter. So we have a very healthy agricultural sector, very excellent trade relationships through a network, through the fruit producers, to, uh, through Westgrow, our trade uh, agency uh, that does great work. And for more, me, more important, 
is the quality of our products are more and more being appreciated within the context of the United Kingdom. One last point is that we have received a message from the UK from an export perspective from agriculture. And that is what we are now engaging on is the packaging. They were told us that the more and more people are consciousness about that they don't want any packaging of our products, particularly grapes in plastic. They want more ecological material like paper, and that's exactly what we are doing so that we also comply with uh, the new ecological standards uh, for trade. Thanks very much, Ivan. Really appreciate that contribution. A couple of things I might come back to you on, on some of those points you raised, but you started to talk about wine, so I'd like you want to come onto the panel, please. Um, and I just think as a Cape Townian born and bred, leaving Cape Town, passing the power station that isn't anymore, past the cooling towers, past the wines, past the wheat farms, past the apples. And agriculture is very much part of what you grew up in. Is It was all being grown around you. And it's so wonderful to see that that Western Cape is still such a, a, a basket, a food basket, because they wouldn't call it a bread basket, food basket to the country and to many, many others of us who consume your products daily, regularly. And the one that I consume the most regularly is something alcoholic that comes from South Africa. And it's wine, sparkling, whatever... Um, uh, wine related product that I can find and get my hands on. When I left South Africa, I took thousands of bottles of South African wine, which I'm still drinking almost 20 years later. So a, a great uh, lover of South African wine. Siobhan, can you just maybe share with us some of the sort of key things we were talking a moment ago about the water issues and about the COVID issues. So without asking something very, very specific, how has the well-being of your staff been managed? How has the well-being of the crops been managed? What have you done with um, vats that have been overflowing because you've got too much in them, from what I understand? And I do also understand that the, the, South Af the UK market has become an increased market for you in your export world. So maybe you can just take the floor and give us some input on that side. Yeah. Thanks, Sharon. I think um, we spoke about the drought. Uh, the wine industry was quite hard hit by the drought in 20, from about 2017 to 2019. And in 2019, we had a lower than average production. Um, and we had a drop in exports as well as local market, uh, just because of not having enough wine. So when 2020 came along, we were all very excited that we were going to have a good harvest, which we did have. Um, but unfortunately, we had the experience of the ban of exports as well as the ban of sale of alcohol in South Africa. And I think that put a lot of pressure on us. Um, we had five weeks of the closure of exports, so we couldn't get wine to the ports. We couldn't get them on the ship and we obviously couldn't get them to our markets. So that put a lot of pressure on us. One, because shelves were lying empty at a time where consumers were going into stores and buying uh, wine. They were also upgrading in terms of how much they bought. So we lost opportunity there. Um, but what we did do is we thought, you know, every, every challenge has an opportunity at the end of it. Um, and we got together and we really pulled in the international influences, be it media, ambassadors, sommeliers, to really support South African wine. Um, we were in a, in a very tight position, particularly because farmers couldn't, uh, far, uh, sellers and, and um, wine stores couldn't sell wine directly to the public in South Africa. So we needed that support. Um, and I think the international markets rose to the challenge and really helped South Africa. And I think one of the reasons why that happened was because we have established ourselves now as world-class producers of wine. It's taken a while to really build that reputation, uh, particularly the awards that we've won, the great innovative wines that are coming onto the market. So they supported us. And, and I think it really turned it turned into a positive for us. I think one of the great um, showcases is what has happened in the UK. We grew by a value of 23% um, in 2020. So yes, there was the exchange rate influence there, but that's way above the exchange rate. Um, so value grew, but positively so did volume. And I think what actually happened there was we did uh, come under pressure in, our, in the multiple grocers. So we were we to have an issue of uh, stores being, uh, shelves being empty. But what we saw is higher level wines entering the market and being bought. Um, and we saw a growth in what we call our specialist stores and our independents. 
what's really great is we even had in some of the supermarkets trade supporting us and putting mixed case promotions. I mean, Waitrose was a fine example of that. So I think it, it has been a very challenging year. Um, 2021 has been challenging so far as well. As you know, we were closed down locally, um, but that has now opened up. But I think it is really pleasing to see how the UK has responded. Our biggest market accounts for 25% of our volume exports, so very important to us. Um, and at one stage, we were concerned that the market was starting to decline. Um, and we also felt that it was very skewed to the lower pricing tiers. But the progress that we've made is really positive. And I think that's one of the huge opportunities for our industry is to export more what I call the middle and the higher band wines. Um, I get many a question from, from on, you know, uh, on email saying, oh, we can't find your wines. You know, we can't find the really good wines. And I keep saying to people, well, where are you looking? And they go, oh, well, supermarkets. And I think, yes, supermarkets are starting to stock the better wines now. But if you go to the independence and what I call the specialist trades, um, you will find really good wines and top class wines there. And I think the UK probably it now has, the, yeah, has the so UK probably has the, yeah, <laughs> has the best sort of offering now, I think, than most of our export markets. Um, so, yes, I'm positive that, that there's going to, you know, we will recover from this. And, and, and I think there's some good learnings out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the growth will go forward. And just going back to the one part uh, which we haven't covered with the, the government side, but from yourself that is in industry where people are out there in the vineyards, they're in the uh, wine cellars, how have the human beings and how has the people welfare and the farmers looking after their staff, what sort of challenges COVID brought to your industry at that level? I think huge challenges. Um, there's no doubt what the financial impact of this is. It's, it's enormous. Um, up until the latest ban, which was instituted in December, we were estimating 21,000 jobs would be lost. We now are saying it could easily be 30,000. Um, so, so job losses, obviously income losses, um, you know, when, when you've got a producer that has probably 50% of their sales locally and 50% internationally, they've, they've, only been they've only been able to rely on the international side. And then initially there were the challenges, obviously, in the ports, trying to get the stock out, trying to get uh, ships to come in and so on. Um, so they're under a huge amount of pressure from a profitability point of view. And one of the things that South Africa has really battled with for years, and we've been trying to improve that, that position, is what we call financial sustainability. So return on investment. Um, and that's that was one of the issues we had because we had a lot more listings in lower tier price levels. So we needed to get the medium to higher price tiers listed because there's better return on investment. So we were making really good progress up until the end of 2019, but that has slipped back a little bit into, and I think there are a lot of uh, producers um, and sellers that are struggling. You know, there's estimated uh, figures we were throw that have been published of about 80 wineries possibly going out of out of existence, um, and what is it, 350 wine grape producers. So it's it's challenging times. The other the other concern we have is the excess wine we're sitting with. So we didn't sell as much because particularly because of the impact of the local market, um, and we're sitting with about 300 million liters excess. And we've got a great harvest coming in. It's estimated the harvest will be even better in 2020. So we, we, we're probably going to be about 2% up. So we've got this, this position of what do we do? We've got great wine coming in. We're sitting with a lot of wine. And I think we, we're looking at different ways of trying to move that. But the challenge is what is you don't want to erode the position that you've built from, for the last five years of, you know, trying to get better profit margins. Um, so it's a fine balance. Um, there's talk about probably having some green harvest, um, which is where they pull the grapes off and do nothing with them. Yeah. Oh, that sounds yeah. <laughs> criminal. Um, just the topic we talked about earlier, um, ministers, was around the water aspect. But the other challenge that I know I suffer with a virtual business and with staff that are operating in South Africa is the issue of load shedding. Because it impacts you at a technology level, it impacts you at a communications level, impacts you at a delivery of work level, impacts every aspect in agriculture, tourism, and everybody else that's impacted. Uh, I understand the Western Cape has been doing something quite specific to try and address that within your region. 
Could you give us some insights as to what can be done, what you are looking at doing, and is that going to make you um, more sustainable from a power perspective and therefore impact on the economy when the national load shedding is becoming a major problem? Thanks, Sharon. I'll start, but I'm actually going to uh, expect uh, both ministers are going to come in as well. Um, it's something we've been working on for a while. Uh, we've known that uh, trying to have all your eggs in one basket is always a risk. And of course, a national single energy producer um, that wasn't having the correct maintenance being done was a huge risk for us. So for the last few years, we have been investing in green and alternate. Uh, Minister Mania can talk about our green uh, SEZ on enabling the manufacture and uh, embedded generation in our municipalities, but then of course in agriculture as well, a number of, uh, of uh, farms are investing. Uh, it's also about their own sustainability, their own green footprint, um, but it also is driven because we have a major problem, which is load shedding. Uh, as we speak now, we've just gone to level three load shedding, which wasn't supposed to happen. Um, and of course, this is also uh, has a massive impact on harvest because you know, the, the wine harvest is happening as we speak. Um, so it does have huge impact. But that's a big driver for us to get our carbon footprint right and an opportunity for investment. So I'll, I'll hand over to Minister Mayer first and then Minister May. Yes, we have anticipated that this will happen given the situation with ESCOM, and that's why we have done some great significant work over the last 10 years in terms of the uh, renewable and alternative energy industry. Uh, we have also, from an agricultural perspective, we have commissioned a study to look into uh, the impact of the drought on agriculture, and so we have also established a, uh, a drought portal Number one, that's the context of the water, but now you're speaking more specifically about energy uh, and energy security. Now, no farm can operate successfully without energy sustainability. And so many of these farms also have now uh, linked up with the uh, wind farms and both Minister Mania and myself have been to different times, visited a wind farm uh, in Witzenberg, in closer to uh, Tosa River. And there is a wind farm with about uh, 49 turbines. And they have the capacity uh, to generate into the grid on a daily basis about almost 100 uh, megawatts into the grid in ESCOM. So we are seeing more and more uh, of these wind uh, farms coming up, specifically also in the area of Tolbach. And the reason why I mentioned these two specific places, because that is where we have the biggest soft fruit industry south of the equator. And there are more and more farms that are also using solar energy uh, because we know that this is a major risk. And particularly now today, as we're also facing load scheduling, this is a major risk for farmers, particularly as we're in the high season uh, for the harvest. But the city of Cape Town, they have also the hydroelectricity. Uh, that generate about, I think, 5% of our energy it's to make sure that we have less uh, load shedding. We are now sitting here in a town, Stellenbosch. This will be the first town in South Africa that will have no load shedding. This is a major initiative, and Minister Mania can talk more about that, because his department has been very instrumental in uh, supporting this municipality, and we are on the break of making groundbreaking uh, work here in the Western Cape to make sure that to grow the economy that you need energy sufficiency. And he's been pioneering also the special economic zone specifically for energy uh, security in the agricultural sector specific, but also generally for the economy of the Western Cape. Thanks. Thanks very oh, yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. There was also another major project that I want to talk about is a Hesekwa municipality in the, in the area uh, of Slanguk and Slang River. There we have uh, partnered with the French government. We have the first uh, solar driven uh, uh, plant, desalination plant with solar energy, uh, really uh, producing enough water for about 100 mega liter water per day into the system or energy into the system. And I think we are particularly happy that we are also making groundbreaking work since we are the first a municipality on the African continent that are using uh, the uh, water 
uh, desalination plant pioneered by solar energy. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank it. Um, David, is there anything specific you want to ask? Because then I'd like to turn to Tim. No, I think the, I, I want to make a short point. I mean, the, I think Alan makes the point, obviously, that load shedding is costing the economy, and we believe that it costs the economy about 75 million rand uh, per day per stage. Um, there's recently been a, a change in regulations which uh, allows municipalities uh, who are in good financial standing uh, to, of course, uh, start to procure uh, power from uh, independent power producers. And so what we've done as a department is we've set up what we've called our municipal energy resilience project. Uh, we've allocated significant funding to the project over the next uh, two or three years, essentially to support municipalities in the, the Western Cape with the, the very complex task of uh, procuring uh, electricity. I mean, we want to assist them to get the, the correct policies, plans, resources, and also to back them up to do uh, all the technical work and studies uh, so that they are then positioned to, uh, to uh, purchase electricity from independent power producers. And as, uh, as uh, Ivan has said, uh, we are right here in a municipality, Stellenbosch uh, municipality that has set uh, itself the, the very uh, big and audacious goal of being the first municipality to uh, beat load shedding in South Africa. And of course, I mean, what this does is it builds uh, on significant work that has been done over the last decade uh, with uh, small-scale embedded uh, generation, enabling small-scale embedded generation, and we've exceeded all targets and have probably now have more than 167 megawatts of installed solar PV uh, across the Western Cape. They also, I really do think that there are significant investment opportunities in the sector, and Tim might want to uh, 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 supplement uh, my reply and look at some of those investment opportunities, particularly the Atlantis uh, Special Economic Zone. Tim, if you could come onto camera, I'd like you to sort of blend in what um, introduction you've just had from David. But can we also just look at, we have got investors uh, in the UK, potentially who might want to get invest in anything from a solar farm or green energy through to business process outsourcing um, services being used within the Western Cape or um, organizations that might want to be investing in farming or selling their product uh, or fintech or agritech or whatever it might be to the Western Cape. So if we look at it all now from a more business perspective, if, if you're able to give us some of the insights, how would you recommend a UK company starts that exercise as the second part to your uh, piece, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. Look, uh, the Premier covered the, the headline numbers. This is the most important market for the Western Cape in terms of investment. Uh, a, a, about a quarter of all of the projects that have landed in the Western Cape in recent years come from the UK. And what's interesting is now about 50% of those are in business services and software. Um, so you mentioned the, the BPO space. Uh, and it's actually a, a really uh, strong growing sector, even during lockdown, which is building off the back of UK investments, driving services exports back to the UK. So it's a, it's a super important um, uh, sector growing the, the historical strong connectivity between the Western Cape and the UK. But, but the, the point of that connectivity starts with with actually being able to fly. Um, and we know, you know we've had the British Airways service uh, for many years as a monopoly connecting uh, London to Cape Town. Uh, a couple of big developments on that uh, last year. B BA finally put to bed those ancient uh, 747s that were flying on the, on the fleet, uh, on the route. And uh, so now we've got the new technology coming back when they return to the Cape Town market. But perhaps more importantly, we have uh, competition for the first time with Virgin returning briefly last year to the Cape Town route. Um, um, and, and eventually pulling back uh, because of the COVID restrictions, but certainly their intention is to return and we'll have that uh, double airline service between Cape Town and the UK, uh, which is part of the reason why it's um, the largest uh, tourist market for us historically, uh, with about a quarter of a million Brits visiting us uh, every year. But many of those are investors. And as I said, 
um, the, 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 the point the Premier made about Cape Town and Stellenbosch being Africa's tech hub is, is really important in terms of those UK companies looking to expand into the broader African uh, continent. Certainly as far as tech goes and certainly agriculture, uh, this is uh, an emerging business hub for the wider region. Um, and, and, and that's why a company like Capita has got a, a 500 million uh, rand investment lined up. It was facilitated by our friends at the Cape BPO agency uh, led by uh, Garrett Pritchard. Um, and it's part of uh, a growing number of seats that came during the worst months of the lockdown. So, so we saw the number of international call center seats uh, grow by about 6,000 during the months when much of the South African economy was, was shut down. And that's growing um, services exports back into the UK. Um, and unfortunately, Siobhan's story of, of the de decrease in wine exports is, uh, is an unfortunate reality, but it's actually going against the trend in some other categories. We had a 4% increase in fruit exports that uh, MEC Mayer uh, referred to earlier, and actually an 8% increase last year during lockdown in machinery exports from the Western Cape um, to, the, to the UK. Um, so I'm confident we can uh, get that recovery uh, next year in wine exports. Uh, Siobhan, we'll be working together with Wines of South Africa as the lead uh, promotion uh, agency for wine globally. And part of the reason for that, uh, Sharon, is because of Brexit. Um, people d don't realize, but there's actually a major advantage for us in Brexit. The, the yes, quotas absolutely. in terms of wine increased by about 70 million liters. Uh, so today we're able to export 70 million liters uh, more each year to the UK than we were last year, as well as about 18,000 tons of canned fruit, like the pears, apricots, and peaches that we export to the UK. Uh, so we're working, desserts, yeah. exactly. We're working with uh, exporters, uh, whether they be UK companies investing here in order to export or homegrown exporters to take advantage of Brexit. And you've already seen some of the benefits for us. The deregulation of citrus that happened recently um, meant that we had a, a bumper year uh, of uh, citrus exports into the UK going into the second um, position, mainly because we now don't need those phytosanitary sanitary certificates uh, because the UK has broken away from those requirements uh, from the broader EU market. So, you know, there are not many people around here uh, that probably would have supported Brexit. Uh, Africa is very much about integration and the Africa free trade area, but certainly there are opportunities within it for the Western Cape uh, UK economic and trade relationship. I'm going to ask the last question of you, Tim, quickly, and then if everyone can just be prepared for, just give us a final sentence, because uh, we are coming up to our last minute. Tim, just the last question I wanted to ask you. The panel here today has made it very obvious that the Western Cape is open for business, as the president has said, um, and that South Africa is very welcoming. But the Western Cape, for me, feels even more welcoming, more organized, more approachable. Um, if somebody were wanting to do business somewhere in South Africa, do they use you as a doorway into the country? Because physically they can't do what they want to do in the Western Cape. Or would the Western Cape be the, the place of choice uh, why would they come to you and not to Johannesburg, for example, or Durban? Yeah, just, just help us on understanding to our listeners and those that are going to be picking up the recording. Why would they come to you and what can you do for them nationally as well as locally? I'm going to try and make it very quick. The, the main investment case <laughs> for, uh, for the Cape actually begins with Africa. It's the last great frontier, uh, the last emerging market that's largely untapped by uh, certainly British companies. Uh, and the question is, if you want to grow your business on the continent of Africa, you have multiple hubs to choose from, including some of the ones you mentioned, such as uh, Johannesburg. But the, the economic geography of South Africa is shifting. Johannesburg was built on the back of, of mining and heavy industry. These sectors are unfortunately in some uh, ways declining. And, and the new economy of South Africa is being built on business services, uh, on BPO, on the renewable sector, all sectors that are headquartered in a meaningful way in the Cape. 
And the reason why they headquartered here, those companies, is because we've got a skills base that's unrivaled on the continent because of UCT, Stellenbosch, CPUT, and UWC, as well as the fact that it's fairly easy to convince international talent to relocate to the Cape because of the obvious uh, tourism mm -hmm. attributes and destination appeal. Um, and then there's the question of governance that's provided by the stable platform led by the Premier and his ministers, where the service delivery is at a very high level and you get a predictable uh, service, uh, reliable service from government. So, so actually, it's an African story that funnels down to uh, choosing South Africa as a, as a market still with the most uh, developed infrastructure and institutions on the continent. And then we believe the Cape is the, 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 the premier investment node within South Africa, certainly for future face, facing industry. Um, and we, we, Westcrow works with all of the partners across uh, local, provincial and national government to facilitate uh, investment into South Africa and drive exports from the Western Cape. Thank you very much. Um, Siobhan, if I can ask you to start with the first uh, sentence, literally a sentence because we are overrunning already, uh, but I'd like to give you all a closing moment. I think from my side, um, yeah, I think South Africa has amazing products to offer. And as, as Tim's already said, the Western Cape, um, you know, is where, where it's all happening in terms of production. And I, I think there's, there's huge opportunity, particularly to the UK right now. Um, so I'm very positive. I think there's always a rainbow after a rainstorm. So I think there's big opportunity. <laughs> and um, yeah, we open for business. We want to build and grow and export as much as possible when it comes to wine, which is our expertise. From a wines of South Africa. Keep up the good work because Thank South you. African wines are absolutely fantastic. I do enjoy them hugely. <laughs> Premier Wendy and Ministers, uh, would you like to just have a sentence each ending with Alan? Maybe you can close for us. <laughs> Let me firstly. Uh, Yes, I will start. Uh, I want to say that we had some excellent rain here in the Western Cape, and you cannot farm without the predictability of water. So we have not only rain, but also good quality of water. Secondly, uh, as Tim rightly pointed out, investors want to know, do you have a capable state? We have a capable state led by our Premier, and we have some world-class farmers and farm workers here in the Western Cape. And by all... Uh, indicators we will have a record harvest uh, outcome this uh, this season and we have as we've heard uh, from the colleagues some of the best wine in the world but not not only wine but also other products but certainly wine is one of our best uh, products that we are currently exporting all over the world thank you thank you very much appreciate it david so I I mean, I think the, the, the three point, key points to make, we are open for business. There are great opportunities in our province for investment and government stands ready to do what it takes uh, to facilitate uh, trade and investment with the UK. I think my last word is Sharon, when you uh, are next in Cape Town, I certainly look forward to sharing uh, a good glass of, uh, a great glass of wine with you uh, when you're next in the Western Cape. Absolutely looking forward to that, David, in every respect. Um, Premier uh, Wendy, would you like to have the, the last word? Thank you very much. Uh, great to have the last word. I think, uh, again, uh, just reiterating, as a government, our job is to enable uh, the, the private sector and uh, specifically where we need to grow our relationship between the UK and the Western Cape. Anything that we can do to enable that, uh, that's what we're there for. And uh, I think specifically, I want to thank you uh, for hosting this, uh, for putting this platform together. And uh, it is so easy these days. So uh, let's not make this a one-off. Uh, let's, let's keep on working at it. And of course, we also need to put the issues on the table that need to be fixed, because that, that's, of course, in creating that enabling environment. What are the problems? How do we smoothen that out so it actually makes it even more uh, of a joy? to work together, to trade with each other, uh, and to grow our economy together. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Tim, having been the last person spoken, I'm going to, for purposes of time, have considered that part of your closing statement. There are a couple of statements of some interesting bits of value added information within the chat, which we will pick up and put into the hand, uh, final 
email that goes out to everybody with the links to the recording. But equally, um, Premier Wendy, if I may, I will probably make contact by Dean and just get some contact points that would be useful um, points of how people can get hold of you for what purposes. So if we can put a little aid memoir together that can go out to all the registrants, which is a fairly large number of people. And then uh, the part that I have to say, which was the, the message for me, is open for business, agile, innovative, and looking at all the options and not accepting the circumstances you're faced with, but improving them and taking the opportunity. And it was wonderful to see my home province doing such amazing things with such uh, drive and personal uh, ambition to make it work as well as you're doing. So Dean, thank you. This has been an extremely interesting um, conversation. We could go on another hour, but we know by uh, uh, Zoom fatigue, people will start dropping off. That wouldn't be very helpful. So thank you for the uh, quality of uh, shared information that you brought uh, for us. And to Premier Wendy, to his two ministers, to Tim CEO and Siobhan CEO, I'd like to thank you all very, very much for the quality of information you've shared. And as we always say, there's a silver lining to every cloud as the rainbow after the rain. Uh, it is so nice to have that positive, upbeat South African spirit shared with all of us in addition to all the information you've just shared. So apologies, I think this is the first webinar I have ever overrun, but we had to deal with government ministers. So thank you very much, everybody. It, I really, there's so much more we could have shared. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. And to all those who've attended, thank you very much. Please share the links with your friends to get some direct information from the Western Cape government. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And enjoy your weekend when you get to it.